Um, welcome to the Effective Developer. My name is Sven, um, and I want to talk to you about how today, how about to work smarter and not harder. Um, so I'm, I'm working for MongoDB, but I've been working at a lot of other technology companies before, and this is just a gathering of all that I learned from those, from those companies. Um, so but if, if we think about what is an effective developer doing, right? Um, so an effective de developer is actually writing smart code. So very, very cool code, very smart code. Um, so uh, this is one thing. The other thing is like those, those developers are fixing bugs immediately. Um, so if a bug come, come, comes in, um, they just jump on it, they fix it, and it's done. Cool. Um, they know where the code is uh, that they have to fix. Adding features like a champ, right? So they have the backlog, they grab their features, put them over, work on it, and they are done. Um, and also, they never stop, right? If they stuck because they need design or something, um, they just ask the designers and then jump on the next feature, work on that, come back to this one before when the design is ready and work work on this feature, on, 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 the, on the feature before. And they are always on, always available. They live and breathe the code. Now, um, this was actually me uh, three years after, grad after I graduated. I thought I am super effective. I have figured everything out. Um, I, was, I was adding code. I was living and breathing code. I thought, this is so great. And I'm so super effective. I'm a super developer. Um, but really, when I look back now, is it, was it really the best uh, uh, time to spend my, my day with? Uh, or let's see. So smart code, writing smart code, very, very smart code. And the code was so smart that I actually said, I don't get it anymore, uh, what I wrote there two weeks ago. So I bet I don't touch it. It's working. That's cool. Um, fixing all the bugs. Bugs come in, I fix it. But I never, I never took the time, actually, to, to work on the root problem. So what is the real problem and fix that instead of just fixing it on the surface? Adding new features like a champ, yeah. Someone asked me, can you add this feature? I said, yes, I'm doing it. But then maybe one user was using it from, from thousands of thousands of users, or it, it actually got never used because it was not implemented like the person thought it uh, would work. Um, never stopped. So jumping here uh, on, on the next feature and then jumping back on the feature before, well, that requires a lot of context switching. And we know that context switching is a bad thing, right? We have to, we should have, I should have prepared stuff uh, before I started with something instead of stopping and, and going on. Um, and then always on, I was living and breathing code. I was, I was really in the code. I was, I was, I was, I was living in the code. Um, but I, I forgot to take a step back and look at the broader view and think about what is really needed for the next one, two, three, four months, six months, maybe two years, right? So uh, that's what I'm missing. So I actually was not very effective. I was maybe very efficient, but effective, hmm, not too much. Now, you must say 2003, that's 17 years ago, Sven, you're an old dude. Uh, yeah, that's may, that may be true. Uh, and we had some, some other stuff. We didn't have the technology that we have today or the knowledge that we have today about software development. Look at that. We were walking, working with a waterfall process. Um, I had a CVS system where I checked in my files and I might need to admit, I also used the file system to store my source code, uh, which was horrible at that time. But there was, there was not really, I mean, there was just CVS. Um, and then we were working in silos. So there was a QA department, and then there was the IT department, uh, and we didn't really communicate. Now, we're living now in, in 2020, right? We know that Agile is there, no waterfall anymore. Continuous integration, continuous delivery, awesome. I just put put in my code and it's built automatically and uh, we have DevOps, we work together with the ops guys, right? Uh, and even more things like cross-functional teams and cloud. Uh, do you feel super effective with all these things that we have right now? Well, let's work a little bit smarter, right? We should, we should, we should not work harder, but work smarter. So I, I brought some, some stuff with us. Uh, and the first thing I want to talk to you about is the code. How can, we, how can we write good code and how can we improve our code and why does good code makes us more effective instead of efficient? 
Um, so you, you might say, Sven, what? We should spend more time writing code. The machine doesn't care, right? The machine doesn't care if I spend more time thinking about my, my code. Well, but humans do, right? If you write good code that is readable by humans, uh, then it helps a lot because we actually read code more often than we write code. So we should spend more time in thinking about writing real good code so people can read that code more easily. Um, so if you look at these class here, uh, well, uh, looks uh, kind of kind of ugly. There are some some problems with it. Um, and I, I look at that, I open it and say, I don't I don't get it. So I will find the, the developer that has produced this class. And then I find out that Ooh, it was me that wrote it. Shoot. Um, so um, there are some things in, in that, that that doesn't really that doesn't really I can't I cannot read the variable names. Uh, no camel case. Uh, there are some problems with with the spacing and the intent. Um, or, and there's also the the curly braces are sometimes in the same line, sometimes next line. And then also the if statements are sometimes uh, the variable name is before the number or whatever. Uh, so uh, I cannot I really have to adjust my, my brain to it um, always when I read it. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and the variable names like deduction A, deduction B, I have no clue what that means. Um, so instead of that, choose, choose good variable names. Obviously, I know you know that, uh, but just to, as a reminder, uh, super important. And then um, format your code so everyone can read it. Why is code formatting so important that you have, and I don't want to go into tabs versus spaces or, or what, whatever, how long the code, the, the line should be, 80 characters or what. Uh, don't want to get into the discussion. You should take that with your team. But I think it's important that you have a rule and your whole code is, is, is formatted uh, with, with that rules that you set up. Um, why is it important? Uh, look at that. The human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. We don't read the code, but we see actually what's, what's happening by just looking at it and, and trying to figure out what is the structure of the code if the code is formatted always in the same, in the same way. We can, we can uh, read the code more easily. Um, so first thing, have coding standards, have formatting standards to, to have your code more readable so people can read and get it faster. And then also choose meaningful names, right? For variable and methods. Just take your time and try to, to, to use real names that represent the reality uh, instead of deduction A, deduction B um, to make your code more understandable. Now, some people think like writing clever code is, sim is, is pretty cool. It's, it's cool. Uh, let's, let's do that. Let's write clever code. Uh, but mainly it's pro protecting knowledge, right? If the code is so clever that no one else can understand it, it's protecting you, your knowledge, uh, and you can just change the code. Uh, maybe even even not you, uh, but you should you should actually it should be more like okay if the code is simple it's 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 better so you should have this culture of of creating simplicity simple code over very very clever code that it's hard to understand um, because you should write code and read code so go and write code and also read code wrote, read open source pro projects and 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 learn from that um, and then next uh, next next advice is write more code and read even more code and then write even more code and read even more code but don't forget there's one thing you shouldn't forget yeah also to delete code right there's some some code that is never used or it looks horrible and you need to refactor it so delete also code um otherwise uh you end up with with with, with, a, with a big big code base that no one can understand anymore um about understanding how to, how can you how can you enforce those rules how can you make sure that everyone put meaningful names into the code? Well, you can do that by doing code reviews, right? So invest time in code reviews, super important, first to ensure consistent code quality, but second, and that makes you really effective, right? Um, it makes it really effective to inspire junior devs to write good code too, because then you spend less time trying to understand those code from the junior developers. So how do you do code reviews right? So here are some, some, some rules, uh, some guidelines, how you can, can do great code reviews. So first, if you see a class or, or C code that it's added and you just shake your head and say, what's going on here? First, seek to understand. Try to understand what the author 
has done with it. So take a step back, what wanted to do with it. Um, take a step back and try to understand that. Um, then if you, if, if you think that's not cool code, just criticize ideas, never people, never criticize people. Um, and also if, if, if the idea is not, not, if you think the idea is not good enough, just don't rant, but make suggestions. So make suggestions how, to, how this code can be improved. Don't write, write, write down like, this is how I would do it. Uh, don't spoon feed. And I will come to that a little bit later also, just to tell people what to do. That's not a good way. People have to figure out themselves. Just give them hints. don't spoon feed. And then also comment on positive things, right? Um, so make, make things positive and uh, encourage people to, that, that they're not frustrated about code reviews, but really like code reviews because you say, that's great. That's a brilliant solution. So take those rules by heart, add your, your own rules, put them up into your workspace once you work in the in office again, um, and, and, and work together on make, making some, some more rules here. All right. So code reviews are, are about <clears throat> also about learning how other people write code. And you can learn a lot by that, right? Um, and when I started actually uh, to become a developer and I started my first job, I said, wow, cool. This is so amazing. Great idea. This technology makes so much sense. Wow, cool. Let's try that out. I was very enthusiastic about software development. Now, during the years, I've seen a lot uh, and then people come with new suggestions and you get kind of, of this kind of person like, oh, really? I will also survive the microservice and serverless hype. I will go over. I've seen it coming and I've seen it going. Or really, this, this new developers come up with a really new front end framework again? <sighs> okay, I will survive that too. Scrum boards, hey. I don't need scrum boards. I know what's already important, right? So, or code reviews. Code reviews are not for me. My code is brilliant. My code is great. So I don't need code reviews, right? So what you would call that is this grumpy developer. I know you're all not grumpy developers, but <coughs> sorry, excuse me. But you probably know some grumpy developers. So you have worked with grumpy developers that are just like, oh, no, I don't need that. I'm sitting in my corner writing my code, boom. Um, and somehow, somehow, if, if, if you work longer in this industry, somehow you become a little bit like this grumpy developer um, because there's some so new, much new technologies and new things and wow, containers are the new, new normal and stuff like that. Um, there, don't get me wrong. Um, there, there are always new technologies and some of those known new technologies just bring us a tremendous step forward. Um, but our industry is also like this, right? A new technology, so exciting. Let's do it. Let's try it out. Let's jump it in and put it in production code, which is not probably uh, the best idea to do that uh, right away. Um, but we need to learn. We need to understand those new things that are coming up. So we are in a, in a, in a, in a phase of continuously learning. So if you're in this industry and don't want to learn anymore, it's the wrong industry. We need to continuously learn. But how do we teach ourselves? So the first thing is, for me, is like I'm listening a lot to some podcasts or audiobooks um, uh, during when I commute to work. Or not right now, I'm not commuting to work. I'm uh, doing some workouts outside, and then I'm listening to some some new technology podcasts. So do that. Uh, it's it's a good way to 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 keep up with what's going on. Um, once this pandemic pan pandemic is over, uh, we can go to meetups again. But there's also great virtual meetups. Um, or conferences like these ones uh, where you can learn something. Meetups has the advantage if you meet in person um, just to, to, to build up your network uh, and, and, and talk to people, right? Uh, what one, one developer here at MongoDB does, Lauren Schiefer, she, she's organized that book club and that's so cool. I don't normally read books, uh, and it's, 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 but, but she really encouraged us to read a chapter a week and then we meet every, every week to, to talk about the chapter. So we attend people reading the same book. Uh, and it's really encouraging to do that as a team. What I did is uh, when I was a team lead, I did this video Friday. So we were not going to a conference each month or each week. But we wanted to learn still from conferences. And there are all these videos out there from conferences that you can just watch. So on a Friday afternoon, 3 p.m., we sat down, watched a video, and then went into the weekend afterwards. We had a small discussion around that. So these are our video Fridays. Try that out. Um, 
But you, you might also think like, or I hear that from some junior developers, why do, you, why, why do we need to learn all these technologies deeply, right? All answers are on Stack Overflow already. So all answers are out there. I just have to grab them, copy them, put them in my code. I don't need to understand all this. Well, you do because you want to train your brain, right? You want to try and solve the problem. You want to understand the root of the problem that you have and not just copy paste things. So the first thing, if you run into a problem, try and solve this yourself. Try to understand what is really the problem. Of course, go to Stack Overflow if it's just like changing a color of a button or what, I, what do I know? Um, but if, it, if it's something more deeper, try to understand uh, and solve the problem. Sometimes we get stuck. That's okay. That's fine. We can ask for help. But before you go to your coworkers, there's a, there's a trick here. Um, ask yourself for help. And this is a technique called uh, rubber ducking. Uh, you know this rubber duck. Uh, and what you do is you explain the problem that you have to a rubber duck. And this rubber duck is always smiling. It's friendly. But you frame your problem from a broader view. And, 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 and often you get the answer yourself. And it's just like, oh, I... I was so caught into the problem that I didn't get the broader view and I should try this. And some, often it helps, but not, not always. So the third thing is to admit that, I don't know, go to a coworker and ask for help. No problem with that. Um, learning is about making new connections in your brain. Um, and we, we, we need to constantly learn. And there's new things coming up, as I said, and making these new connections. But we have to also have to destroy connections because sometimes we have some old information in the brain that is not valid anymore. So for example, if you're going agile, people are just have their waterfall connections in their brain and they just want to do mini waterfalls, which is not agile. Um, so we also have to learn to unlearn, right? We need to, we need to unlearn some, some things uh, in order to learn new things. So think about that a little bit, like maybe something that you learned in the past isn't, isn't really true anymore. Um, and we are all, mostly of you, are probably senior developers. And we should be, a, and that's also about being effective, like um, trying to teach our junior devs the, the knowledge that we have and, and not just teach them, but guide them in the right direction. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about this. So we are senior devs. We should become, become mentors uh, for our junior devs. First, of course, we have to listen. What's the problem? What, what, why didn't they... Why don't they, and not just, uh, why, don't, why don't they have the problem and not just go right in and say, do this. Um, ask questions, ask questions that lead them maybe to the right solution. Um, give them just directions. As I said, don't spoon feed, right? Don't tell them directly what to do, but give them directions so they make their own connections in their brain. Um, we are not the Stack Overflow people, right? We are not Stack Overflow for our junior devs. They have to figure it out themselves. Um, and then always have an open door so people come back and can, and you can answer questions. And the first time I was just thinking, I was doing this, I was thinking, I have the answer in my head. I can tell this person, uh, write the answer right away. Uh, why do I have to go through all these loops here? Um, but I was surprised. This person came up with a, with a, with a, with a solution I haven't seen, and it was, it was working. Um, it was really working, and I would, would have thought about something totally different as a solution. So it helps also me, <laughs> if I do this mentoring, to continuously learn new things, right? Um, so that's, that's also, also a great way to spread your knowledge, um, also with junior deaths, to become a mentor. So as I said, it is continuously learning. Uh, it's a continuously learning. We, we, we can't stop learning as software developers. But then at the same time, it's also continuously unlearn things that we learned. Um, and that's, that's even harder to unlearn things, unlearn habits, right? Um, but we just have to make it clear in our minds that this is, this is super important. Becoming mentors and advising people also continuously. If we learn something, we have to pass on, on all on our knowledge and guide people in the right direction. One thing is missing here, and that's experimentation, right? Some things that we don't know really um, also, if we learn that, we have the theory, but not the praxis. So get practical, right? And this is, this is something you should put time in your calendars to experiment. And that makes you super effective. Experimentation makes you super effective because you learn something new and you know is this worth using in my, in my, in my software development or not. Um, well, now, 
this is this is the reality, right? We have a board with 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 a lot of uh, post-its on, and this is all tasks that we want to do. Uh, but that's not everything because the rest is probably in Jira uh, somewhere stored in the backlog. So you go into Jira and there's a whole heap of backlog. Anyway, um, so but we just take take tasks out of it, work on it, done. But actually, we actually know that this might not all the best ideas. We just gather them together, put them in. Uh, maybe the product manager has written them down. But is that the best idea? Probably in some cases, yes. In uh, some cases, no. So we have this known unknowns. We, we know that there must be some task in there that is not very smart uh, to do. So we, we ask ourselves the questions, is there maybe a better solution out there that will help the customer more? Is there maybe a new technology that can enable us? Or are we missing opportunities? Are we, are, are we not looking out of the box or not, not, what, not, not going out of the box, right? Don't be shy, just try and carve out time uh, for, for that. So first, what I did as a team lead, I get the team together and say, hey, one and a half hours a week, each week, we set and try out a new programming language or whatever. Take Rust or whatever you want to learn um, and, and make that uh, one, two months every week, one and a half hour. It's one and a half hour of improving. Even though you can't use that in production, it helps you understand the concepts behind those programming language. Uh, and maybe you, you use them one day in production. Second thing is tools training. We use so many tools, right? But are we very effective or efficient uh, using those tools, right? So look at your tools and try to add, try, try out new features. Um, go and maybe you don't know so what, what features are in there. So look at these, these uh, chat sheets um, from your IDE or from whatever. Um, it's not about learning the, the shortcuts that makes you maybe more uh, efficient but not effective. Um, it is about, okay, this, this, this is a functionality that is in there. I didn't know that, so let's try that out. So also tools training makes you more effective, let's say half an hour each week. Uh, so we got two hours actually of improving. And one thing is about, this is not very innovative, right? But um, we want to have some innovation in our software too. We want to be very innovative uh, because this makes really the difference between our product and our competitor's product. If our product is innovative, great. Uh, we, have, we have put in innovative ideas. So let me tell you about some innovation fails that some companies do. Some companies have this innovative person, the lone genius uh, that has all these brilliant ideas and tries them out and give them to the team. Not a good idea. Uh, we all have good ideas. Even the boss is the genius. I've seen that and I've worked for bosses that they thought they are the genius, um, but uh, actually uh, also not true. There's no one person that can be the genius because we all have good ideas. I told that already. Um, and that is a thing that actually we tried when I was at, at Atlassian. Um, we put together the brightest minds and put that together in a team and have them work on their brilliant ideas and give that to the other teams. Didn't work out. Uh, everyone thought ideas, uh, cool ideas are happening within that team uh, and no one actually brought up uh, their cool new ideas um, because everyone has actually ideas. The only thing that is missing here is that we don't have, the problem is not the lack of ideas, right? The problem is the time that we get to try them out. So we should, we should use some time to, to try them out and see, oh, this is a great idea and it's really working or this is a, was it, I thought it was a great idea, but it's not really working out. Um, so give them time to try them out. Also to show your ideas to others. Uh, how much time do you need to try out your ideas? Let's say one week, 40 hours. Hmm maybe 30 hours. Well, you might know, or you, have, you have tried it yourself, this 24-hour hackathons. Um, actually, at Atlassian, we were one of the first ones that were starting this. We called them FedEx days uh, until FedEx said, you're not allowed to call them FedEx days more. Well, we thought it was clever, to, uh, delivering in 24 hours, right? Delivery in 24 hours. Uh, they call them called ship it days at Atlassian. Um, but uh, actually, they're practicing it uh, since... Um, uh, 15 years now and doing them quarterly. So here's, here's uh, what, what, what we learned uh, when, we, when we have those uh, 
days, those hackathons. Um, the first one is the planning phase, right? So plan the dates ahead of time. That's two months ahead so everyone can just mark it in their calendars and have time to work on their innovative ideas. Announce and tell stories, right? Say, okay, we're doing this hackathon uh, and then people can put in their, their cool ideas and, and tell stories uh, what they want to do. And then also we're doing brown bags. So just two weeks before, we're trying to find our team uh, maybe you need a designer, maybe you need a marketing person um, and, and, and try to pitch your ideas within this brown bag. So, and then on a Thursday afternoon, 3 p.m., the event starts, right? We have a big clock. Remember, time is ticking, 24 hours down. Um, it's all about fun, right? It's not about getting the best ideas and showing it to the boss, but it's, it's, it should be fun. It should be really en energized uh, and energizing um, and also get energized, right? <laughs> eat pizza, eat some, eat some uh, and, and drink, drink some energy drinks. Um, also very important to just make, make it a fun event. Um, and then at the Friday, 24 hours later, we give, we give our presentations. It's just uh, three or four minutes pitches about what we did. Um, also, this should be fun just to convince people to vote for your presentation. And then we vote for the winner and have a, have a small party. Everyone is tired, goes home. Um, but then the, the thing is like the innovative ideas, some, some, some ideas go on the pro product roadmap because they are really, really cool. Some don't, um, but then plan the next hackathon already. Uh, at that at that stage, so people know. Okay, I can I can I can have my next cool idea at that time. Um, and the thing is, not only software developers were doing it. Uh, we also encouraged everyone else uh, to come up with cool ideas. Even though you people couldn't write software, they're working in marketing or something. So here's here's an example where people put in a hidden hidden whiskey bar uh, in the office. So this was a social social. <laughs> social uh, experiment uh, like okay trying to get people together in the whiskey bar after work uh, and have have casual conversations uh, so this is the hidden whiskey bar once you're in the Atlassian Sydney office to go there um, so 24-hour hackathons every quarter that is 0 0.7 hours a week you spend on hackathons it's 2.7 hours of improving this is not a lot, right? From your 40 hour week. Why don't we just take our time to improve uh, or maybe even, even make that more often uh, or make the training, training longer. So invest in discovery time. This is what I wanna say. We need to invest time in order to take on the next step uh, to be more effective. Now, our calendars look a little bit like this. I know that. Uh, where's the time you might say, Sven? Where should we, should we take our time? We have so many meetings get rid of meetings, right? Reduce your overhead to be more effective. I know it feels like you're busy, but um, you, you, you should look into it and maybe you should just uh, kill, kill some meetings here. Um, maybe you're not the right person in that meeting. Maybe you just have to say something for five minutes or so. Um, so just look at your meeting calendar, kill some meetings. Uh, and if you wanna call in a meeting, just uh, make sure that uh, this is an effective meeting. Um, so. Here's, here's a, a, a metric. You can see that later on my, you can, you can download that later on my, on my uh, webpage. Uh, and uh, so why do you call in a meeting? Um, and you just can, can look at that. Let's, let's go through it. Uh, make a decision, solve a problem. Get free. Okay, I want to make a decision. Okay, good. Uh, does it need to happen in real time? Uh, yes, yes, it does not need to happen in real time. Does everyone have enough background information to get it done? Uh, I, I want to share that in the me meeting. Oh, fix that first, no meeting. So this is a meeting decision uh, sheet. So you can see, uh, and uh, if, if, if you need to call in a meeting or maybe something else will work better um, and save time of people because Meetings are, are, are we, we have a lot of those, uh, but we need to make them effective. So first thing you have heard about that, have a clear agenda. And I mean that. Even one-on-ones, you should write down your, your tasks that you want to discuss, uh, have a clear agenda for, for that meeting. And in the beginning of the meeting, just let people leave. Let's say you have the agenda, you show the agenda, and then uh, who, who, who doesn't have to be here? And get those people, give them free time and let them leave the meeting. Um, of course, yeah, shut down laptops if you're physically, if you're a virtual meeting like we all do not right now, um, just say nothing else, no chat, 
just concentrate on the meeting so we get faster through it. And then there's this thing, and that that's what we have in every office, uh, in every meeting room, and it's a rubber chicken uh, like like this here. I don't know if you can see that, and you can just squeeze it, and it makes the sound, <laughs> right? <laughs> What does it do? What does it do with effective meetings? So if someone goes off topic, you just do this. <laughs> and then everyone knows, oh, that was that was off topic. Uh, let's go, let's let's go, let's go back on, on topic again. Um, so this rubber chicken reminds everyone like and, and it, it's it's getting so so much in uh, we, we're getting so much into it that we just have to look at the rubber chicken on the on the desk and everyone knows, oh, I'm going off topic. Uh, the, the person that just spoke says, oh, I'm going off topic. Um, so going on topic again, um, meetings, emails, Slack messages or chat messages. These are the real time sucks. And why do we, why are we so attracted to those, to those things, right? Um, because it's actually the e easy stuff. We tick the boxes. We just go, ah, oh, yeah, done, 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 done. Ah, oh, I answered 20 emails. Great. I answered all the Slack messages. Great. I'm sitting in a meeting the whole day. Oh, I'm so busy. But at the end of the day, you thought, oh, I, did, I, I didn't get anything done. So also think about working on the hard stuff that really takes some time to get into, to think things through, to work on it. Um, how, do we, how do we get time for that? So first thing, reserve some time as a team where you deeply work. So I, I actually did that with my team. We said, okay, we, we need three hours a day. That's not, that's not a lot, but three hours a day where we don't answer emails or we don't answer Slack messages and where we close the door of our office, no one can come, come in just in an emergency. So people were really looking forward for, for their time. Uh, they had their the meetings in the one morning and then we had from 1 p.m. till 4 p.m. We had that deep work time as a team and it was super concentrated. Everyone was looking forward. We, we made our lists like, this is what we want to work on in that time. And so super productive. And we went home and said, yeah, that was a super productive day. So think about doing that as a team. Sometimes pe people get disturbed um, and uh, we as a team, everyone gets asked, but we, 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 we nominated one person as the support person. And that was changing from week to week. So everyone was just like the support person for one week. Um, uh, we actually, uh, so, so, so we had someone just on the Slack channel uh, that people could Slack us and so just one person was answering that. The other one weren't, weren't in the Slack channel. But um, then also people came into our office. So we had some, some token on our desk saying, hey, this person is the support person. So go to this person can answer questions um, and, and the, the rest of the team just working on, on concentrated stuff, right? Also a thing that we did was getting stuff done days. And getting stuff done days is also pretty cool because some, some things, you, you don't have the time for that, right? You, you said, ah, oh, yeah, the refactoring, we have to do that. But if you just cut out one day in your calendar where the whole team works on one thing, and don't go to meetings, don't answer emails, don't go Slack messages, maybe in the morning and in the evening, but otherwise they're concentrating, working on one thing, you get a lot of stuff done. Uh, and just doing a getting stuff done days helps you also um, with, a, with a team morale because this is always sitting in the back, these tasks, right? Um, these are always sitting in the back. Um, so wrap that up. You should work on the, the hard stuff too. Uh, or, or carve out time to work on the hard stuff and not just get attracted because this is a little bit like the dark side uh, on the easy stuff, right? But what is actually the hard stuff? What, what, what is it uh, what we should work on? Um, what is it that matters, right? And if you want to be effective, this is really it. Work on what matters. Now, I give you this, this anecdote here. So, Think about you want to build a power plant. Let's say it's a very environment friendly power plant uh, and there's one expert that talks about all the technology that they have in the power plant. And then in the meeting, uh, you also talk about this one here, the bike shed. Everyone has an opinion about the bike, bike shed, right? Oh, should it have a roof? Which color should it have? And all the conversation concentrate on this small thing instead of the whole power plant. And this is happening. This is happening in projects. And it's called bike shedding, right? Everyone talks about this low priority thing, but everyone has an opinion about it because 
they don't understand the whole power plant thing, but they understand bike sheds. Um, and it's called also priority delusion. Uh, be aware of that. Spending too much time on things with low impact. Think about what is really the problem that we want to solve. I've seen, seen so many people running into projects and they already had, had figured out what the feature should be instead of what problem do we want to solve with that? But they already had the solution in mind and worked on the solution and then it was not the right solution for the customer because it didn't solve the problem. Um, so think about the problem first, like why do you want to solve it? What is the validation data? What are possible solutions? Just to open your mind, right? So at Atlassian, we have worked on a thing called Project Poster. And that is asking this, the, all these questions that you should answer. And it brings the team together on thinking about what is the real problem we want to solve instead of thinking about, oh, this is the solution we need to build, right? Um, so Project Poster, also a linked list um, on, my, on, my, on my list uh, afterwards. Okay, so you have fit out your project poster and now you cut everything into small user stories. We, we love user stories, right? So for example here, as a user, I want a new statistic button so that I can see the data sets. Uh, that's not a good, a good user story. Also here, you should think about the customer. What does the customer want? What does the user want? As just mean, I want uh, the number of data sets so that I can plan for growth, right? Um, this is a problem that maybe many MongoDB users have, right? I want to, want to see what is the number and how does it grow and stuff like that. So think like your users. Put, it in, put yourself in the shoes of your users. So like Jasmine, she wants to, to, to know all these data sets. Or Lucas, who's a full stack developer. Uh, or Tina, who's a data scientist. These are all MongoDB users and we should think with everything with the eyes of, of the user. Um, now, these are, of course, not real users, and you probably have that too, personas, but try to make those personas real. Not saying, oh, this is the admin, this is... No, this is just me. She's a developer in training, and she's learning all this new MongoDB technologies. So that makes this user real, and that makes you think more like a user. And please remind people that you have those personas, and these personas are important if you build the software. Remind them actually everywhere so they don't forget the personas, right? Now, now you have all those cool user stories, right? All these great things, right? Ah, oh, we're working on this, 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 and this. Um, it's a little bit like this, this map here. Uh, what should you work on first? Now, there's probably this one here, the happy pass that people are taking when they use your software. So think about the happy pass where 80% of all users are going through. The rest is maybe not so important at the moment. These are corner cases. I know we as software developer, we jump on that corner cases, but what if the user clicks three times on the button? That's not what users do. Um, yeah, maybe there comes an exception, but hey, uh, that happens maybe once a day if you have thousands of users. Uh, so work on your optimizing your happy pass, but you, maybe your users have problem going through your, through your happy pass. So think about that. So this is a technique called journey mapping. Uh, probably you know that, um, but just a reminder here, that here you go through the different days, phases. So we, we put that down. That's just an example here. Um, and that's a happy pass, actually. This is what people have to do to go through, uh, to learn the software and to learn, learn how to use the software. And then we wrote down all the, all the thoughts that people have during that phase, right? And then we wrote down all the problems that people have, right? Um, so these are the problems that people have that we should actually address to work on the happy path. Um, and we do that for, for every, every persona that we have. So different personas have different journeys. Um, try to map your software like this, and it helps you to get a better picture of, of how people are using your software. Now, you might say, hey, we are developers. It's called the effective developers man. It's not the effective product manager. We are coders. Yes, you are coders. Um, but once you work one year, two year, three years for your, for your software, you should care about the product you're building. Um, I know that's not maybe for everyone, but you should think about it. You should become something that is a term now called a product engineer. So caring about not just about the, the, the engineering part, the software part, but also about the product part. And you could be a great bridge between the product manager and the coders. Um, so how to become a product engineer? Just do some hallway testing. 
this is this is also a good thing. So just do some hallway testing to get immediately feedback. The product managers are probably organizing all this user testing, but if you do hallway testing, you can you can actually get first time feedback for your software. You actually can see people. You get uh, the reacting to to things that you have done. So do some hallway testing. Sending developers on support is also a thing. So we're sending developers on support for one one week a year. They're going on support and answer support care questions just one week a year right but this makes a great connection to the users so you connect the the users with the developers and the developers get a better understanding of what is what are the users doing and if you don't do so i mean we are devops pro so you probably have that already in mind but be a data detective look at the data the data uh just give you hints about about things it's not telling you the whole picture right um but it gives you hints it's also combine that with interviews but it gives you look look also at the data and don't just ignore that and says I'm just doing the code. Um, so here's a here's a quote. I wish engineers spent less time understanding the problem and more time coding. Who said that? Nobody. Nobody says that. Nobody ever. Right? Okay. I started here with with some bike shedding, um, and it's not not about only about. Uh, that bike shedding is a thing. Uh, you can also use that, um, and that that's just be between you and uh, 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 and me, right? So don't 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 tell that everyone else. You can use that um, for your for your advantage. It's called evil bike shedding or dark bike shedding, the dark side of bike shedding. So there was this chess game in the eighties um, where they actually programmed it and there, there was a lot of requests from the management uh what what should be done uh and the the programmers got frustrated about it and and things like that so what they did is actually they programmed a little duck right a little animated duck that was when the, when the queen was walking across the chess field the duck was following the queen so everyone in that meeting in that release meeting talked about the duck is that really necessary do we need that duck it's cute but huh? And no one talked about all the other things that they wanted to, to talk about before, uh, actually. Um, so, so this is evil bike shedding, people just putting on something that they can talk about. Uh, so keep that in mind, but maybe don't, don't use that always. Um, but makes it makes more effective, maybe. I don't know. Uh, OK, good. Let's wrap this up here. So I was, I was talking about a couple of things here in the last nearly 45 minutes. Um, the first thing was writing good code, right? Um, and that makes you more effective because can you read code easier uh, or faster and have simple code and train your junior devs to also write great code, right? So you don't, you understand also that code. Um, constantly learn. Learning is something that is in our industry that makes you super effective. If you know all this new technology, if you know things, um, that makes you super effective. But also try those things out. It's just like the theory behind it just doesn't tell you. It's just other, other people's opinion. If you try things out, like trying a new technology, experiment, come up with new stuff, uh, also makes you super effective. Reduce your overhead. This is maybe more on the efficiency side, uh, reducing your overhead. Uh, but Still, uh, also being more effective, if you reduce overhead, you got more time on things that really turns the needle, that really makes a difference, that really matters, right? That brings you more, whatever, revenue, customers, users, uh, happy users. Uh, so work on what really matters. So why are actually we are so caught up with efficiency? Why are, we, why are we talking always about, hey, we need to be more efficient, uh, get more done, get more stuff done? It comes back from the Beslim Steel Factory. And there was one guy, one manager called Frederick Winslow Taylor. You may have heard of Taylorism. Um, and he actually went into the factory and tripled the output of the factory by having custom-made shuffles and organizing the, the, the work line. Um, so... And, and, and this is something that we still do, but we we are not we 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 are we are not uh, factory workers, right? We are knowledge workers, and of course we can work on producing more databases, which doesn't make sense because you can download uh, the software um, for free. Uh, but hey, uh, but we should work. We we need to concentrate on making our database more awesome. Um, and, and more, more usable so people can just use it or more scalable so people can, can be, uh, so, so we can be more effective. 
Um, so if I put it into that output oriented efficiency is about getting more output and don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's good to, to uh, get more output, but um, if, if, we, if we should pick some, some of these two things, I would always pick the outcome. So work on, on stuff that really matters uh, and that makes you highly effective. So to wrap this up, think outcome first, be effective, right? And then get shit done. So thank you very much. All the slides are at svenpet.com slash talks. And uh, I'm actually one minute over time or no, eight seconds over time. So um, sorry for sorry for that. So uh, just put it just just write me a, a tweet if you have a question at Sven Pet. Um, so thank you for your attention. Thanks for joining my talk. And hopefully see you next year at DevOps Pro in Vilnius.